Executive Director of Levitt Pavilions, and also here today is my colleague Vanessa Silberman. She's our Director of Communications and Strategic Initiatives, and we're a national placemaking organization. And about a year and a half ago, we recognized that our organization was going to enter a new chapter of significant growth. So the timing was right to take a step back and examine the effectiveness of Levitt as a placemaker. So we decided we wanted to do a multi-year, in-depth study to evaluate the impact of Levitt Pavilions. So after numerous conversations with academic teams and research firms across the country, we selected Slover Lynette to design and conduct the study. We felt it was really important to have an outside unbiased evaluator determine the impact of our program. And Slover Lynette is a nationally recognized audience research firm, and Sarah is their vice president for arts and culture. So before we get into the study, just wanted to tell you a bit about Levitt Pavilions. We are a program, as Barnaby mentioned, that is activated at the local level through outdoor performance venues. Each is community driven and it is a public private partnership with the city. Our mission is to strengthen the social fabric of America. And how we do that is we transform underused neglected public spaces into vibrant places community destinations where all, all are welcome, everyone is welcome, and a focus of our organization is access to the performing arts. So these venues become citywide destinations where people from all walks of life connect, people whose paths would never cross otherwise are interacting, having a shared cultural experience, and our vision is that these shared connections then extend into daily life, making our communities healthier and more interconnected, and therefore strengthening the social fabric of our country. So we are a national network, Levitt by the numbers, as we have six venues in operation currently. Collectively, they present 300 free concerts to the community every year, reaching approximately 500,000 people, audience members, every year. So there's 50 concerts at each local venue. Our current locations include the original Levitt Pavilion in Westport, Connecticut. We also have two in California, in Los Angeles and Pasadena. We're in Arlington, Texas, which is part of the Dallas-Fort Worth metro area. We're in Memphis, Tennessee, and then also in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, the Levitt Pavilion there is our newest in our network. It opened in 2011, and it's the focal point of the Steel Stacks Arts and Cultural Campus, which has received a lot of national attention because it was our nation's largest brownfield that was transformed into an arts campus, and that's part of the Lehigh Valley. We are growing. You'll see six Levitt music venues and growing. We're opening our sixth Levitt venue in Denver in 2016, and we have pavilions in development in Houston and Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We're in active conversations with Seattle, San Jose, and New Orleans, and then in exploratory conversations with a variety of other cities across the country. And these cities approach us. We don't go into a city and say, we need a Levitt Pavilion here. These communities have heard about the Levitt program, and a lot of it is just through world, word of mouth, and, and we're you know, putting ourselves out there a bit more, letting people know who we are and what we do through conferences like these and through our communications efforts. But these communities really approach us because ultimately these are community-driven projects. We provide the framework, but they're locally interpreted. And each Levitt Pavilion, speaking of that framework, has three key characteristics. One is that free concert, 50 concerts are presented every year. So that space is used on a regular basis. All of those concerts are free. 
So, these, so we're providing and ensuring arts access to everyone in the community. And then the other key characteristic is the open lawn setting, which is conducive to fulfilling our mission of creating interactions. We call it a 360 experience. People bring their lawn chairs, their lawn blankets, and you can connect with people in front of you and back to you and the side of you. People get up and dance, children run, and there's really an opportunity for a spontaneous community. And then what's also very key to our program is that what's presented on a Levitt stage is high quality professional entertainment, high quality sound and lights. You see everything from acclaimed emerging talent to seasoned award-winning Grammy performers on our stages. If you were to, um, it's comparable to what you would see in a performing arts center. Typical ticket prices for these artists is between $20 to $90. So it gives you an idea of the caliber of arts that we're providing access um, to in the community. And there's really something for everyone on the stage. Of those 50 concerts, it's musically diverse, it's culturally diverse. And the programming is designed based on the values of Levitt, which is about inclusivity, engagement, collaboration. And what that equals is that what you see on the stage, what's happening in the lawn environment, even the architecture, the design of the venue, you'll see they look different. It's all community driven and it's all reflective of the community. So even though we're, we're a national organization with a national framework, it's very much community driven projects. So our model is a triangle partnership. It involves a local nonprofit Friends of Levitt Pavilion, which is created specifically to implement the Levitt program of 50 free concerts, to work in partnership with the city, to work in partnership with the community, to ensure, engage, to ensure use of the venue beyond the 50 concerts, and then to work in partnership with the National Levitt Organization. Every Levitt Pavilion is city owned on city land. So there is a long term, as Barnaby mentioned, a contract. There's a long term agreement between these three parties, 50 to 99 years. The city guarantees that it will maintain this venue, maintain the grounds. It also guarantees that for the next 50 to 99 years, this nonprofit group can use the venue free of charge. And then it also says in that contract that the National Levitt Organization will be a committed lifelong partner. So we help launch the project. We guide the launch from first conversation, from that first phone call to opening day. We are their partner in forming the, the local nonprofit. We are their partner in developing a relationship with the city. But then beyond that opening day, we are a lifelong partner providing ongoing technical assistance, capacity building, support and guidance. And also, in addition to this impact study, which is um, external, we also do consistent internal evaluation. And we, we ask, um, this year alone, we've asked 300 questions of our Friends of Levitt nonprofits. And we take that information and we see if there's trends throughout the network. We share that data so the Friends of Levitt can create benchmarks and compare themselves to other organizations. So we're also consistently um, facilitating shared information. So in terms of why we decided to do this study, as I mentioned, we were entering into a new stage of growth. But we've been at this for 10 years. The, the original pavilion was in Westport, Connecticut, opened over 40 years ago. And it was a very organic community process where a group of citizens in the early 70s said, we need a community gathering space, a performance venue for our community. And what started out as a very modest concert season concert series evolved into the Levitt program, as we know it today, of 50 free concerts. And that's what we used for the Levitt model. It was based after that. But our first, what we call Venture Philanthropy Pavilion, launched in 2003 in Pasadena, so 10 years ago. So the timing we felt, you know, what we talked about this morning, you know, these projects take a long time. And we felt that we were at a place where we could really begin evaluating the impact of of this program, and we, we have assumptions. We assume that on the lawn, this social connectedness is happening, that people are interacting, and that that is making our communities healthier. We assume that we are building social capital for our communities. We assume that we are contributing and improving the livability by having this presence of this cultural access asset that is activated on a regular basis. We are contributing to the health 
of our community. Then in addition to those direct assumptions, we also assume that we have these ripple effects. Because there's this cultural asset, the community is safer, crime is decreasing, this foot traffic, our pavilions attract, you know, on average 75,000 to 100,000 people per pavilion. And so this, this foot traffic is increasing economic activity. We assume that we're increasing the uh, community engagement. So we have all these assumptions and we wanted to know, we felt now's the time that we can really look back and say, are, are we really fulfilling our mission? Are we really building social capital and strengthening the social fabric of communities and ultimately our country by having this national network of pavilions? And we felt it was really important to have an unbiased look at that and therefore we partnered with Slover Lynette. So we wanted to um, look at our assumptions critically even if we got a response that we, we uh, didn't want to hear, no, those assumptions are not correct, or only half of them are correct. We really wanted to learn from that so that then we could do further self-evaluation. Okay, some of these assumptions are proving true, some of them are not. What can we do for our guidelines? How can we um, alter our best practices so that we are resulting in a more in-depth community engagement? Because that's really what we're all about. So taking a, a, a step back for self-evaluation and looking at our assumptions, and ultimately, sharing this knowledge with the field. When we first decided we wanted to do this multi-year in-depth study, you know, we're online, we're searching, and we saw a lot of vibrancy indicators and um, a lot of questions. How do we measure? How do we evaluate? And since we have this, this long-term uh, track record, and we've, we've, we know we've been successful, but how are we going to define that success? We thought it'd be uh, very useful knowledge to contribute to the field. And then, of course, with the funding landscape, we wanted to show that social impact is more about place, social impact through place making. We, we do have a ripple effect, we believe, of increased economic activity, but we really focus, our mission is to strengthen the social fabric of communities. So we really wanted to gauge the social impact of, of our program. And, and many arts organizations, that's, that's what we do in addition to the, uh, the economic impact, it's about those intangible, making our communities healthier, and how can we show the importance and effectiveness of that to increase investment in placemaking organizations. So with that, that's, that was the impetus for the study. You know a little bit about Levitt Pavilions now. Uh, feel free to come up to me and my colleague Vanessa throughout the conference if you want to know more about our program. But with that, I will hand it over to Sarah Lee, who will talk about the design and methodologies for the study. So what I'm going to do is just show you one quick slide that shows you the shape of the study and preview a few questions um, that I feel like are, are, are sort of discussion questions that I have on my mind that I'm really eager to talk to all of you about. And hopefully we can continue talking um, throughout the conference. So here's the shape of the study. And there were um, a number of things that we had on, in our minds when we were designing this study, in particular all of the challenges that Anne spoke about this morning, as well as those couple of great blog posts that she mentioned, the, the ones by Aunt Ian David Moss and Anne Markison on Create Equity. So the shape of the study that we're looking at is a triangle shape. Um, we really thought that triangulation was a key principle for this study. We, we knew we weren't going to be able to look at everything we wanted to look at in a single study. So we're conducting three separate related studies and using them to sort of triangulate the social impact of Levitt Pavilions. Um, the first study is an audience, is, is looking at outcomes at both the audience level and the community level in two cities where Levitt Pavilions are currently operating, uh, Pasadena, California, and Memphis, Tennessee. And we're using multiple methods to collect data about the impact at both of those levels. So we're not just thinking about the um, physical transformation of the spaces in those cities, but we're also thinking about the social transformation that happens when people engage and participate in a musical experience at those sites. Um, so we did some observation of people uh, attending concerts at, at each of those um, uh, pavilions in Pasadena this past summer, and we'll do Memphis next summer. We also conducted surveys while we were there um, at the concerts and conducted a number of stakeholder interviews, talking to people at the policy, the business level, the nonprofit level, to get their perceptions of how uh, the pavilions had had, had an impact on those um, neighborhoods and the city beyond them. The second study that we're doing is, uh, is a unique opportunity that we have here with the Denver Pavilion opening in 2016. 
we're doing a sort of pre-post study. We're looking at doing an, a community ethnography in Denver this past summer before the pavilion opens, and then we'll do it again in 2017 after the pavilion's been in operation for a couple of years, so that we'll have that opportunity to look at how a community really does change on the ground level uh, after one of these pavilions has opened. And then we have a colleague who's doing a more traditional um, uh, indicator study, doing some econometric analysis of, of secondary data to uh, look at the causal effect of these pavilions in the cities in which they're located relative to a matched pair um, sample of cities that are similar to those in which there are pavilions but, but which don't have a pavilion. And so we're sort of triangulating and looking at both causal impact and descriptive, um, a descriptive analysis of, of the impact in these places. So the couple of questions that I'll just briefly preview um, for you. And the first one I think is the big one that's on my mind as I'm coming to this conference, and that's how do we balance the inherent complexity of placemaking interventions um, and the importance of simplicity in really being able to communicate uh, the impact that these kinds of interventions have. Um, you know, one of the things that occurs to me about Denver in particular is that uh, Denver is a community um, that's in flux. The, the, the park in which the pavilion will be located is in flux. It's changing. Um, it's changing sort of independently of and dependently on the pavilion um, being introduced to that site. And that flux is sort of an asset from a placemaking perspective. The fact that there is change that's already happening, that's something to be leveraged when thinking about this, uh, the development of this pavilion. But that flux is actually a, a measurement challenge. Um, it makes it harder to be able to sort of say that the impact that we're observing is causally related to the pavilion. And I think that that means that as a research and evaluation community, we just need to develop better tools for understanding causality in that sort of complex environment. Sharon, do you wanna say a word about this, this last question here, which I think is the other important one that I know is on your mind? So the other question we had, going back to what I was saying earlier, is the importance of social impact of these creative placemaking projects because that's what we're about and we see so often at the policy level and some and oftentimes at the funder level well what economic impact are you having what is the economic development how are you moving that needle and what we're looking at and in, in developing these measurement tools that we can share with the field is is how do we effectively communicate that social impact is just as important as economic impact because that social impact creates healthier communities, it creates interconnectedness, and that in and of itself can create vibrancy. And then of course you can have all these other ripple effects through social impact. So that's a question that's weighing on our mind. Yeah. How do we effectively communicate that? And how do we get the people who aren't part of our field to really understand it? Because people who aren't part of our field tend to see dollars and cents, and as someone said earlier today, they count on their hand. And so how do we how do we effectively communicate these intangibles as being just as important? Yeah. And uh, we're, there's much more to be said. I'm happy to share much more about our thought process in designing the study, some of the guiding principles that were on our minds, and what we're starting to see with the couple of, um, the couple of data points that we've already um, collected, the, the parts of the study that have already been conducted. I'm happy to talk about that further um, and to talk about these bigger picture questions. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll find some time um, during the rest of the conference.